Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today, with a slight delay, we're bringing you day 259 of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Today's topics, uh, situation in Kherson, uh, possible death of uh, one of the collaborants, Tromosov, and problems of supply and the southern part of Russian front. As always, with Mark Fagan, Russian opposition politician, and Alexei Aristovich, advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel. Enjoy. Dear friends, I'm glad to see you all on Fagan Live. It is Wednesday, November 9th. Time is uh, five minutes past ten in Kiev. Sorry for a little delay. Uh, we're going live in uh, difficult conditions. And, uh, you know, Alexei is in uh, Kiev. And, yes, our usual guest, Alexei Aristovich, at this hour, the 259 and we're discussing this war again we have over 180,000 watching us over 34,000 click the like button today is a good day we have a ton of things to discuss so share links to that stream in your social media share it with your networks and friends and family and those people who do need to see that make sure they have a chance to see our news and discussions and of course do not forget to click the like button that is important to promote it and the youtube algorithms and to make sure it is suggested to a wider audience do not forget to subscribe to fagan live mark fagan is almost at two million subscribers and to channel of alexa rostovich and of course to the privateer station that is bringing you that is bringing you these uh, streams daily let's start with main news yeah let's not uh, go around it let's attack the main news today so what's your estimation are they indeed playing a theater or they for real decided to leave Kherson and other villages on the right bank of Dnieper so I need to say that probably first time in these eight months of war they said truth they said a true point saying that defense of your son is really perspectiveless I understand that they are playing a scenario or something that some script that they discussed but they did uh, mention a piece of truth in that scenario in their speech that it is uh, lacking perspective to keep holding that bank ukraine will capture her son would have captured her son under any other condition and it just differs how would it be would we capture it in winter in walking over the snowy fields and uh, capturing burning our left russian equipment and trying to revive frozen Russian soldiers who are trying to surrender or are they retreating there themselves from there themselves so I think they figured out how to do that and I think that's one of the skills that Russian army learned in this war they learned how to retreat they really oh yeah they are very organized they are very organizedly retreating from their current positions and first of all if it was a full retreat there would be more detachments leaving right now it's a smaller retreat it's a smaller trickle so right now through Novokakhovska dam they had about 200 units of armor that managed to cross it it's not too much they withdrew some but they only withdrew it from the front from the first line of defense they're still taking second and third lines and they mostly taking them alongside the irrigation channels so these are natural barriers for armor and tanks they are destroying bridges they are destroying bridges when they leave when they leave and sometimes they destroy them before they leave while they still control the area then they put pontoon bridge in other place where we did not expect them to cross because of course we are controlling the existing bridges and the bridges whenever we see there is aggregation of troops or equipment we are shelling them some of the main damages we caused them in kiev operation is uh, from the bridges when they were trying to cross rivers when they were on the bridge we were hitting them in mass so they became wiser they 
destroy bridges and do that for the purpose that some commanders, uh, it would not be too tasty of a treat for them to still try to use the bridge. And instead, they put pontoons on the river in other places and they cross the river by those pontoons. So there is no immediate full withdrawal. It's a very organized process. And uh, we still have two questions unanswered. How fully will they withdraw? Will they hold Kherson itself? Are they planning to do the Arya Guard fighting with us? And our troops are very slowly advancing, very carefully, pausing to gather additional intel. We do, did capture quite a few settlements, and I actually have three commanders, uh, three people who studied with me together on that front and they do liberate a lot of those and they know all that they they're texting me saying we're going forward and they know all that but i still send them back hey be careful check for mines check for traps check for counteractions because i would be doing that if i'd be leaving i'd be using all that to slow down the advancing army so Russian army also is using artillery while they're retreating, not too concentrated, but they still do. Unlike them, we concentrate our fire in certain locations. And I think we're more successful. And when some Russian propagandists with last name starting with uh, Shah and ending with Tsa will be talking that uh, it's all pre-agreed and some people like, you know, Mark Salonin, uh, oh, I'm sorry, don't bring him, he he's expert in other fields, not in the war. Some people may come out and say that it is a, a pre-agreed stuff. There is nothing pre-agreed there. We are shooting at them with everything we can reach them with. Problem is that we don't have enough heavy equipment to reach far. This is the third, actually fourth major retreat of Russian army. And we are trying, our goal would be to prevent them from leaving that theater or to at least preclude most of them from leaving. That's what happened in Kiev. We were shooting them very, we did some concentrated fire on the routes they were taken to retreat. But again, they managed, some of them managed to leave, a big number managed to leave. Same thing here, we just don't have enough capacity to completely stop them. And even in Ukrainian sources, some people are screaming that, oh, they probably pre-agreed that with the Russian army. If they were in the front, we are using anything and everything to try to hold them uh, and basically bury them there where they are right now. Unfortunately, most of them, I estimate, will be able to leave just because we don't have enough capacity to stop that. Is it because you guys lack equipment? Yeah, 70% is uh, just simple lacking that equipment. We, we're using what we have at 100%, but we need more. And our allies, uh, probably most of it, most of their issues is they don't have free equipment to transfer. Uh, and then another 30% is uh, maybe political game and trying to grow to the level where they'll be okay with giving us. But anyway, uh, we can state that we are taking Kherson in the near future. So near future, what is it? A week? Two? Mark, it is very difficult to say. It could be, attention, two to three weeks or it could be five, seven days or it could be much longer. It depends upon so many factors that I'm not aware of we don't know the exact ideation the exact uh, strategy of russian command because they do have enough troops to provide for area guard fighting and to keep kherson and create some street fighting in kherson we don't see them en masse storming the bridges they are leaving but we cannot say they're leaving in mass and also maybe it's not possible because you mass leaving positions would be what swimming across the river we don't see that yet so we'll see okay so why do you think they took that decision they just cannot hold it it's lacking perspective to hold that bank we would have taken Kherson, but it would be a much more disastrous scenario for them so first of all they cannot keep it because of the supply issues right Sure, Mark, you have a regional center. 
Why do you think they evacuated a lot of civilians? Because they wanted to lower the traffic on the river crossing. So you also need to supply food and other things to civilians. And you only have maybe two semi-destroyed lines or some random pontoon places with welded barges together as a bridge. I think their last attempt was to evacuate locals en masse to try to decrease the pressure on the bridges and the supply routes, but it quite failed. They didn't succeed. People did not want to evacuate. So some did, but not many. Do you think there is a political background there too? They would be not even them. See, they're playing the card saying, hey, see, we're always drawing. They were screaming about preconditions, not to Kiev. They're, they know that Kiev doesn't want to talk to them. But perhaps they could address that to Americans and say, let's talk. See, we're doing gestures of goodwill. We are withdrawing. See what we're doing here. That means that we are ready to negotiate. See, we did that near Kiev, Suma and Chernigov. See, we're doing Kharkov, we did Kharkov regrouping, and we're doing that here again. No, it won't change anything, Mark. Our position doesn't change. And also in that theater play that they aired between Suravikin and Shoigu, they're leaving because uh, incapacity to hold it. And the, another question is, how are they withdrawing from the territory that they just announced to be annexed by Russian Federation? So they are withdrawing their troops from what they call Russian Federation territory? They're just giving up their land? So when some people are telling me, oh no, it's impossible that they leave the whole territory of Ukraine, I ask them, why, what do you mean? Because they are leaving even from the territory they annexed. And I think it's the first time when they're leaving the annexed territory that they declare to be Russian. Right. So they'll leave. They'll leave uh, the whole territory eventually. We'll make sure they do. Americans left many other fights. Americans, for example, left Vietnam, left Afghanistan, left Iraq. Rus why Russian troops cannot leave Ukraine? They'll walk like bunnies. They'll cross the borders back into their land. Have you watched uh, their social media? They are screaming there. There is just wailing going on. Oh, that's a whole other aspect. Because moral aspect of this is really not settled yet. This is one of the biggest strategic defeats of Russian army in recent history. And our journalists, I just keep laughing at Ukrainian media, they, most of them are posting Russian troops uh, or Putin's regime is withdrawing troops from Kherson, automatically devaluating the lives that we lost, that we lost, the blood that was spilled, kicking them out of Kherson. We are holding them accountable to what they do. We are pushing them. We are shooting them up as trying to bury them there so they don't regroup someplace else. And I love free press, but they are sometimes just cannot go dumber when they make these statements. And um, I also need to say that, yeah, I do love our military forces, but over in Kherson, it's a mix. It's territorial defense, it's military, it's police. And do you know how many peaceful civilians, do you know how many citizens of Kherson will find, how many butchers will find when we get there? There are just three of them that I know, according to the, some operative data that are already there. So what, Russian troops uh, voluntarily liberated the territory from themselves? I'm addressing our journalists. Ukrainian troops kicked Russians out. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's an evil thing. No, no, Mark, I understand. But new terms and new speak is very quickly to grab, to grow roots, and then it becomes standard. Well, if you think, right, why would they leave if uh, there was no pressure of Ukrainian army? Even Suravikin in their theatrical play did uh, mention that there is no reason for them, there is no mean for them to hold that side. And he is talking that 
Artillery is reaching our heads, and they're effective in reaching our heads, so they're acknowledging that Ukrainian army is pushing them out. I remember that movie with uh, Sharapov and Levchenko, when the two main heroes discussing how they were at the Second World War in some beaten up position, discussing that one day it'll be a beautiful day when they liberate the city, and yeah, that day is, is almost here. And that's what Russian opposition, that's what foreign observers, that's what many people were talking about. Take Kherson. You will have a strong victory and it will be a big strategic woe in Russia. It will be a big moral defeat on the internal. By the way, I'm just getting text messages here from my pals on the front there that they're not fully leaving, they're still preparing. We notice that they are still preparing troops to be left in the city for street fighting. So you think it's still fake? No, 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 they are withdrawing, but their ideation is probably to leave enough uh, people in the city to create enough casualties on the Ukrainian side. It probably will be a bloody story. There could be some pretty heavy area guard fi fighting. But regardless of how heavy that fighting will be, how many losses each of sides will suffer, in Russian media and in Russian social networks, they're already screaming. Because what the F4 to go fight there, when the only regional center Russia managed to capture during these eight months of war, Ukraine is about to liberate. So if uh, Qatar military or any mobilized is thinking two thoughts together, They'll be asking questions, so why are we leaving the city? What what if Ukrainians uh, kick us out of some other place? Okay, we'll waste another tens of thousands with blood to capture something else and then we'll leave it again. So that seems like a budding strategic and moral breaking point in this war. It will continue likely. They'll be fighting for Lugansk, Donetsk, Crimea, other parts that may take us months till next summer, but strategic break is right upon us. It's like Stalingrad battle on the Eastern Front in the Second World War. It did happen, and it is happening in our view. After that, I don't believe anybody in Russia will continue trusting government that this war can be successful for Russian Federation. This is the break. There will be fighting, there will be heavy fighting, there might be some counter-offensive, and we can talk about Pavlovka separately. But the strategic, moral and political break is in favor of Ukraine at this point. And I don't think anyone in the Russian Federation will believe again that this war is possible to be won. Up until now there were some naive people, but I don't think they can exist much longer. And it may take them some time to come to grasp with that, but... All right, let's follow the map. Surovikin did speak about other things. And yeah, he did mention that he killed a billion Ukrainians, uh, a billion tanks, as always. Dropping numbers from where? Nobody knows. So a sad story near Pavlovka, a sad story for Russian troops who tried to de-block. And he's saying that there is fighting going for Pavlovka. Well, it's too early to say before the general command confirms, but evil Russian media sources are saying that we wasted 300 of their marines in that uh, place. So they had about five or six groups, they added a couple more, they entered Pavlovka. They, I'll explain that Pavlovka is that small piece, a uh, small place near Ruglidar, where the red arrow is pointing to. So ours didn't really retreat fully. We had a good fire control and we had a good position for counterattack. And then uh, some evil tongues in the Russian media are saying that there was some special airborne brigade that uh, joined and um, the fight from the Ukrainian side, and it on, not, did not only help the Ukrainian forces in Pavlovka, but it also went beyond and is cutting the Russian supply lines and kicking their butts and taking names. It's basically a scalping time right there and their supplies, routes. Um, so they're kind of failing there too. So just look at that, 40,000 people on that front and how stupidly they're doing it near Pavlovka. 
Let me show the screen. I don't have time to send that. This is the map of railroads of Ukraine. Do you see that's Volnavaha, that red spot? Do you see that's Kherson to the left? This is the biggest railroad line on the south. In general, there were just two lines, including Kherson. They had uh, Crimean Bridge and uh, Volnavaha route to Kherson. From Volnavaha to Ugledar, it's about 36 kilometers. It's like 20-something miles. To Pavlovka, it's even closer. And from there, you can use field artillery to cover that station. You don't even need long-range artillery. We use long-range artillery already. So that means that's the end of the supply of Southern Group. And here I'm making a statement that their failure in Pavlovka area was the last drop to make a decision to withdraw from Kherson, because Crimean Bridge is not fully functional, and that railroad line will likely be interrupted. They will not be able to continue providing stable supply through that route. Through that route. Do you understand the scale of this event going on? So they have two defeats, Kherson and Pavlovka. And Pavlovka was an attempt to counter to counter that situation, and they're failing. But stupid people waves near Solidar and Bakhmut, they continue. So the political task to take two towns and mention that uh, Donetsk region is fully captured, this is just a political task, and it completely overwhelmed military logic, because likely you'd want to have just a little bit on Solidar, but most of those drop down to the south to fight for that uh, Ugledar area. But uh, yeah, they're fighting for political things, they're not fighting for military goals. And I want to address the ones who are young in Russia now, so whenever you become adults and your kids will be asking, how did you manage to lose this war, you can tell them, Putin was a effing idiot, and he ordered to waste thousands of people on unnecessary targets. And I actually will ask my friends to take some pictures from Bakhmut area. It, it's scary, even for military eye. These are just layers of dead Russian troops trying to take uh, fortified positions in vain, instead of throwing these people to solve military tasks, how they would have been or should have been solved. Because taking Bakhmut has no military reason behind that. It's just a political gesture. All right. So let's look at the map again. What's happening if we look deeper to up north to Kharkov, Svatova, that area? Yeah, near Svatova they continue to push a little, to try to push us away from the road, but they're only trying that in a couple areas, and we push them back. So the line of front is not changing. Yeah, it's not. We have not, uh, we didn't give them any inch of a territory, we actually captured some more. Near Belogorovka we didn't give them anything, near Kriminaya we actually gained some, so on that line Kriminaya Marienka, if you draw a line from Kriminaya down south to Marienka, yeah, they're not getting anything. Not a piece. I think that lunar eclipse didn't really work well for Putin's Russia. They faced two very painful defeats near Pavlovka and near Kherson. But I guarantee you that inability to thwart the threat to the railroad line supplying their main group in the south is definitely a factor in making that decision about withdrawal. And of course, symbolically, you see how it works? Where is our friend Stremosov? Oh man, I wanted to talk about that separately. That was my question. Today there was information aired, and I need to talk about that, that our friend, uh, so-called friend, whom Alexei called Spermousov, Mark, let's not talk bad about the deceased. Wait, wait, wait. I don't think it's a big deal in this case. He wanted to kill all the Ukrainian Bandera supporters and uh, so-called Ukrainian fascists and probably Ukrainian military to 
kill everybody. So do you think they assassinated him? There, well, there is a version that public commentary about his death appeared two hours before the auto crash. But thing is, it is not proven yet. It's not. Uh, it only appeared as an information piece. But what's important here is that if you become a traitor, if you join the occupants who are raping and killing your own people, oh yeah, those uh, basements are on him, the torture chambers, yeah, that's on him. And it always ends in the same story. Natural causes, you know, your driver slipped the wheel or some friends aided him to do that. But uh, that's a message to those who change sides. You're posing in front of Russian cameras, you're talking about polit political things. The more you pose, the higher the chances are that they'll get rid of you. This is Russian Federation. Putin's government, it's similar to Stalin's and Ivan the Terrible, it's just he is a smaller scale figure, but you know, you don't realize how it's done there. Normal country, for your treason, if you changed sides and joined uh, the other country, they would have brought you to Kutuzovsky to somewhere, a uh, place in Moscow, they would have given you a big apartment, they would have attached a couple of literary slaves to you so you could write some memoirs and some books and be constantly in the media light to support you that, first of all, you made that serious step to join their effort and then also to support probably future uh, people who might change sides. Soviet Union was actually doing that. Soviet Union did uh, make a point with Kim Philby and the others. Yeah, they were supporting those who changed sides, who defected to them. This is Russia, though. These days Russia is different. This is just a wasted material for them. And you'll see what happens with the rest. Those people made a huge mistake in their lives. Lives. They still, some of them can uh, undo that and somehow go back to Ukraine. But yeah, just think about that. Think about your perspectives. But these people were probably converted before, before the whole incident. He was being talked to before the war and he was already there in a position. So Valetsky understand he's a similar caliber. He's the same guy, right? Saldo, Valetsky, they all will die, right? Let's not talk about them as uh, potentially dead people. But they're not listening. We told them. I know Russian Federation. I know the core of uh, Putin's regime. He treats people like that like resource. That's just a resource to be consumed. Because that's how system works. It always will find a way why to get rid of you. Perhaps he knew too much. He talked too much. Especially in public. He was friends with wrong people, should have been with the ones who converted him, but he was talking to another department of the same FSB. Or why did you sign that paper, or maybe you offended somebody or threw somebody wrong in the basement, in the torture chamber. So they would always be, they would always find a reason to get rid of them. I think it's a classic destiny, and I think he, he was a planned event because it's matching different events on the front and I think one of the very loud mouths is uh, quiet now. Uh, yeah, Mark, and generally the moment of retreat is a good opportunity to remember old things and to figure a few, to cut a few loose ends. Yeah, they could have played a different card. They could have said, oh, Ukrainian diversion group or something. Well, if they bring that, they, people may start asking, where are the additional security measures? Here's your official, right? They, at some point, they had about 2,000 Russian guards, uh, police there. They were, you know, doing some counter-terrorist activities. They were shooting some uh, building from armored vehicles as if terrorists were there so they would have to answer for diversion groups this in this case they don't they just say it's an accident and by the way people are sending me notes that they are starting to dig trenches in Jankoy in the top uh, bottleneck area of Crimea so I need to say this is a good decision 
This is important to dig it, but they won't help them. They won't, right? No. Okay, well, let them dig, right? The soldier needs to be busy. If he is not busy, he might start getting bad thoughts. And what if, you know, other things happen and they start retreating from Crimea as they did from Kherson? What's then? All right, all right, let's move further. We have almost 450,000 watching us. Over 150,000 click the like button, especially the ones watching us from Russia. Those who have relatives in trenches, those who have mobilized, if they have smartphones with them, I don't know if they do, but if you manage to share, that would be successful. That would be a success for us. Make them think about their future. Make them think about their lives and destiny. That would be a good move. Um, please help us with that. Uh, share links and subscribe to Fagin Life, to Alexei Arstovich, and to the Privateer Station if you are watching that in English. Another question. There is a message about NBC, American company. That Sullivan, during his visit to Kiev, when he was meeting Zelensky, he actually probed the possibility for negotiation with Russia for diplomatic solution, reporting uh, one of the people who were present at these conversations. And uh, some of them did mention that, yeah, Sullivan indeed touched upon the possible diplomatic solution to this conflict. And he said that uh, Ukrainian levers to conduct negotiations will be strengthened and not weakened if Ukraine will be ready to neg negotiate. So that game of that kind continues, right? Mark, they will be taking around that topic until the very end. They do need uh, this topic to continue distracting their attention from Kherson. There will still likely be some street fighting and, you know, area guard fighting. At least that's what it appears to be. And from the propagandist side, it doesn't look good, though, because that means that the Ukrainian army is taking Kherson with fighting. It means Russian army did not just leave the city, they actually lost it. So they both, they left it and then they lost it as well. So they'll be playing all other cards. They'll be playing the streamers of death uh, over that, some statements about pre-arrangement, some statements about possible negotiations. But what pre-arranged deal here, for example? Who got what? What would Ukraine get in this case? Well, it doesn't matter. Mark, they're not addressing us as people who are thinking logically. They're addressing people who just heard something. And, you know, there'll be some masses of people who will be winking and saying, oh, yeah, they just agreed to something. Agent Yermak and Agent Zelensky talked to Putin. And now they're playing that spectacle for us where Slav Slavs are killing each other. Or, yeah, maybe reptiloids are also partaking in that. Exactly. So with all the hysteria that's going in uh, Russian networks, Kadyrov says he trusts Suravikin and he completely agrees with re-dislocation, with the relocation of Russian troops. But although this retreat was... A was a, there was a similar situation with Lapin when uh, Kadyrov said that Lapin is bad because he left a couple uh, small towns, but Suravikin is good because he left the only region they actually managed to occupy in Ukraine. So I think it underlines that Kadyrov is not a standalone figure in his actions. I think he was doing that attack on Lapin and other generals because he was ordered to do that. And here he is playing the same task, just in a different direction. Because Suravikin is nowhere near better than Lapin, and I actually suspect that Lapin could have been a better general than Suravikin. But Suravikin, they need, they need his figure for some portrait similarity with Zhukov and Debit, somebody with a low tone, talking difficult truths to people. 
that the decision is difficult. We destroyed overwhelming forces of enemy and then withdrew. And we have success in some directions, but that difficult decision was needed to be made to save lives of our citizens. And that trend The trend is voiced by that Dundon from Chechnya. Yeah, we needed to talk about that because some people had a wrong impression of that whole thing. They, they are not independent figures, neither Kadyrov nor Prigozhin. One will become a president, another minister of defense, right? No, they're just building a party of war to unite ultra-patriots. They're So each of them, both, yeah, they both are somehow integrated with the system of Russian force, Russian power, and they they are grown over with a ton of crimes in their past. Kadyrov, remember, he even stole the federal judge at some point, and how? Yeah, he's, as you mentioned, he, he is probably, what, level 4, level 5 in Russian apparatus. And you cannot elevate them higher than that, because one of them is a criminal guy with criminal background who works with convicts. He cannot fully be integrated into the leadership structure. There is a certain bureaucratic requirements for people within it. It's traditions. It's not that they're better. It's just you have to match certain things. You have to have certain biography. Same thing with Kadyrov, the man who fought against Russia in the First Chechen War. He cannot be capitalized above a certain level that is allowable for these figures, for these characters, for these collaborationists. And he was given general colonel so he could fight Lapin, and that's probably his highest elevation, right? He just did what he, what he was ordered to do. And the man who was saying, I'm an infantry trooper of Putin, he is. He is an infantry trooper of Putin. The infantryman cannot become Putin or above Putin. That's not uh, according to the rules of the game. All right, one last thing we want to address in that relation to Surovikin's statement. He said there are some street fights on the outskirts of Artyomovsk. Is that fake? Yeah, no, we kicked them out two to five kilometers already from that place. In October, Ukrainian army lost over 12,000 soldiers, and they, he said in Kherson region they lost over 9,500 people dead and wounded. One last thing here, so no word about their own losses. Mark, they are talking about their losses, they're just giving it in reverse. They're taking their losses and claiming them to be Ukrainian. When they said, you know, 1 to 7 or 1 to 8 ratio of Ukrainian troops dying versus Russians, he actually reversed our data. The ones that we have, we know that we lose one person for one fighter for their 7 or 8. They're just choosing the same thing in reverse. They're saying, no, that's what Russians, how Russians are fighting. And that actually matches to our calculations. 9,500 is roughly about uh, how much they have lost if we keep the same ratio as we have lost. So you can calculate if you're interested our casualties on that front in that time. Um, 470,000 watching us, over 140,000 click the like button. I thank our viewers. We're trying to stick to 40, 45 minutes, not go above that. So you're working with us tomorrow, right? Okay, good. There'll be another stream tomorrow, so we'll talk about everything that uh, evolves. There'll be likely new interesting elements to discuss, so come tomorrow at the usual time. 10 p.m. Kiev, 11 Moscow. We'll meet and discuss. Thank you for joining us. Again, share links. And do not forget to subscribe to our channels, to Fagin Life, to Alexei Rostovich, and to the Privateer Station, if you are listening or watching that in English. So please connect, click, do what you need to do.